vi rejste til månen med Apollo, blev vores verdensperspektiv for altid forandret. Roger, zero G, and I feel fine. Capsule is turning around. Oh, that view is tremendous. For første gang blev vi i stand til at se mod og jord på afstand. Billedet gav os en forståelse af, at vores skrøbelige planet er en enestående del af universet. Mens teleskoper forlænger vores udsyn længere forbi solsystemet, begynder vi at forstå, at vores verden også er forbundet med en galakse i voldsom og skabende forandring. har den danske fysiker Henrik Svensmark arbejdet på en ny teori om klimaet. Allerede nu står det klart, at hans resultater vil ændre vores forståelse af klimaforandringerne. The processes that takes place in our universe from exploding stars and also dramatic changes in solar activity are affecting us much more directly than we ever dreamed of. Gennem morgen har jeg fulgt Svensmark og hans kolleger i deres kamp for også at blive hørt i en verden, der har vedtaget, at den globale opvarmning er menneskeskabt. The fact is, that clouds and water vapor have the biggest greenhouse effect on the Earth's climate. Men måske skal mysteriet om klimaforandringerne findes i de helt almindelige skyer på himlen. In times when everybody is talking about CO2, clouds are a really important factor of climate change. Without clouds, the uh, climate on Earth will be completely uh, different, and just small changes in the Earth's cloud cover will change the Earth's climate. So understanding clouds is a very, very crucial point. The mere idea that processes in space, and not just processes on Earth, is important for climate, I think is, is deeply fascinating. In 2005, we actually found experimental evidence that the Sun and the galaxy is determining climate here on Earth. But for some reason, no scientific journal wanted to publish this. It was a big disappointment for me and my team. There is a problem that has always been with us. New ideas are rarely welcome. In science, where particularly some young person not known in the field proposes some radical new idea, he may experience great difficulty in getting it published. The bottom line seems to be that instead of thinking of clouds as something being um, a result of the climate, it actually sort of upside down. It is that the climate is a result of changes in the clouds. The first time I got an idea of how important clouds could be on the Earth's climate was when my boss Eichel Fritz Christensen made a discovery where they found a beautiful correlation or agreement between solar activity and the Earth's temperatures. The agreement was so good that it could not be accidental. And this was really a big inspiration for trying to understand and trying to use clouds as part of that explanation.
when we published this in 1991, it was at a time where everybody believed that the warming that had taken place during the century was mainly due to carbon dioxide increase man-made greenhouse gases. Uh, so uh, when this community saw this perfect, nearly perfect correlation between solar magnetic, now magnetic activity changes and temperature, they were very surprised. What we could see was that when the magnetic activity of the sun was larger, then the temperature on the Earth was higher. Nobody had an answer to what kind of mechanism could be the cause of that. We knew that somehow the magnetic activity on the sun had to have an influence on the Earth's climate, direct or indirect. But how this would come about was a real scientific mystery. But one day, someone stepped into my office and mentioned cosmic rays. When I heard this word cosmic rays, it made me immediately think of an experiment I did in high school where we had what is called a cloud chamber. Inside the cloud chamber you have supersaturated air and when a particle, for instance a cosmic rays go through, it makes a string of small droplets like a small cloud. With this image in my head I thought, what if cosmic rays are responsible for forming clouds? And what if the sun with its magnetic field is capable of changing the clouds on Earth? Then we would have a perfect explanation on how the sun would be responsible for climate through our everyday clouds that we see on the sky. You cannot see or feel the cosmic rays, but they are let loose whenever stars die in supernova explosions. As atomic particles with enormous energy, they rush through the galaxy at almost the speed of light. And some of them bombard the Earth. But the Sun fights the cosmic rays and controls just how many hits the air. In order to find out if cosmic rays affect the clouds, I began to look for data. I collected satellite data of the variation of clouds in the atmosphere and compared them with variations in the cosmic ray intensity. There was a beautiful clear-cut correlation that surprised me more than I ever dreamed of. Uh, the red curve is for the cosmic rays, you see the variation, and the blue curve, that's for uh, the uh, cloud cover. It means that cosmic rays are affecting the Earth's climate, and that's a fascinating thought, since it means that space is very and directly relevant for us. The magnetic field that comes out of the Sun has more than doubled over the last hundred years. As a result, fewer cosmic rays have sprayed the atmosphere and fewer clouds has formed. The consequence has been a warmer Earth. When a strong magnetic field comes out of the Sun, fewer cosmic rays spray the Earth. That means fewer clouds to keep us cool. But a lazy sun with a weak magnetic field lets in more cosmic rays from the stars. And in the air they make more clouds. That's how the stars and the sun controls the Earth's cloudiness. The uh, suggestion was made by Svensmark in Denmark that this effect of cosmic rays is really important and he based that on the remarkable correlation between worldwide cloud cover 
and the cosmic ray intensity. The magnitude of the effect, if his speculations are correct, would suggest that that is as powerful effect as the present greenhouse effect or the brightness variations of the sun. It remains to be seen now, of course, as to whether that effect is valid, but it is a major contributor to this whole process that needs to be investigated very carefully. This, this idea with the cosmic ray modulation of the cloud cover is probably the most interesting uh, mechanism today. If, if that was the building... And what is found in this research results from, from Denmark is that there's a very good correlation between clouds and the cosmic ray modulation, which we have measured for 50 years almost. But this shows that the, it's the sun's magnetic field that's very important for how the sun appears. And that's very important to understand one cycle and then can, we can go back and try to understand how the sun has changed over long term. We know now the sun's magnetic field have increased and we know the sun is more and more active. The, in, the activity has been increasing the last hundred years by a factor of two. If Sven's March works is uh, confirmed that he's right about this idea, I think it will have big effect on the whole climate uh, discussion because the, the clouds are so effective in, in changing the climate uh, or trapping or closing out radiation. It's now important to do the research to try to understand this mechanism. And uh, so I think we should do, take this very seriously and, and try to understand this mechanism. When we presented our results in Birmingham in 1996, we were of course very excited to present the results, but much to our surprise it was received very, very negative. And the only thing we had done was to present a scientific result which showed that the sun through the clouds might be very, very important. Uh, for climate. Uh, there was of course a reaction also from um, the International Panel on Climate Change, the UN panel. Brad Bolin, who was the chair, scientific chair uh, at that time, he thought it was irresponsible of us to, to say that something else than the CO2 could be the main driver for climate. So there's no doubt that the sun has an effect on climate. The whole climate community really hated the idea that the sun should have a major impact on climate. That was seen as a disaster. I was actually shocked about the, uh, the responses that we got. During the last 25 years, CO2 has been the dominating theory trying to explain all climate variation. However, if you look at historical climate, there's absolutely no doubt that the sun has been extremely important and you cannot ignore it. We're at the Dead Sea. And we're going to a place called uh, Nachal Batim, which is one of the nicest places where you can see uh, climate variations uh, taking place here. People have this uh, conception that the sun is this constant ball of gas that doesn't do anything. This is wrong. In reality, the sun can sometimes be very active. It's this uh, solar activity, this dynamic uh, nature of, uh, of the solar activity, which affects the solar winds and which affects the cosmic rays and which eventually affects uh, climate here on Earth. 
Climate variations over the past decades, uh, centuries, millennia uh, can be re uh, reconstructed from many different places around the world. Here we are now located in the Dead Sea. Uh, 20,000 years ago, the Dead Sea was higher, it was much wetter and the level was higher than, when, than where we are standing. And every year there were yearly deposits which were left on the uh, lake's uh, uh, floor. And here we can see those uh, annual deposits. Basically, uh, during winter the dark deposits are left and during summer the bright deposits are, uh, are left. So the ratio between the dark and the white bands tells us uh, a climatic story it tells us how the climate here varied uh, during the years. On these timescales of uh, centuries and millennia, you can reconstruct what the sun was doing using uh, cosmogenic uh, isotopes like carbon-14. What's interesting is that this carbon-14 is directly formed by the cosmic rays. So this and other results or other measurements from around the world tells us that the sun is affecting the climate. This link between solar activity and climate on Earth, it's not hypothetical. You just see it in, in the records. When the sun was more active, you indeed see that it was warmer on Earth, and vice versa. Three hundred years ago, for example, the sun was not very active, and we were in the height of the Little Ice Age, when it was cold in many places on Earth. A thousand years ago, it was, uh, the sun was active, it was as active as it is today, and it was warm everywhere. The Vikings could uh, map all of Greenland because uh, the northern shores of Greenland were not frozen. <laughs> most of the people today think that most of the climate change is because of CO2, but this is wrong. Most of the warming over the 20th century is because of uh, the sun. If we look at Earth from space, we will see that about 60 to 70 percent is covered by clouds. If more cosmic rays comes down, we will have slightly more clouds. And you can imagine the opposite, fewer cosmic rays, we have a little fewer clouds. But instead of thinking of clouds as a result of climate, it's actually showing that the climate is a result of the clouds, because the clouds take their orders from the stars. After we found the link between cosmic rays and clouds, we only knew that it was a total cloud cover, but I had to find out what type of clouds. And at some point it became possible with a new data set to investigate exactly this. And at that time I got help from Nigel Marsh. Yeah, I, um, I sent that figure to you. He helped analyzing uh, these data. And much to our surprise, we found that the link is actually to the low clouds. So it seems as if cosmic rays are changing low clouds. All right, I'll speak to you later. Yeah. Bye. And that is very, very good news for the whole idea.
I uh, got this uh, result, I thought the correlation was much better than I uh, ever uh, uh, dreamed of. If you decrease the amount of low clouds, it will be more heating down to the ground. And in particular now, the, this new work that they show that there's uh, only the low clouds that changes, which makes it very interesting. There's still a mechanism to explain this that's missing. And uh, it's now important to do the research to try to understand this mechanism. So there's a fairly large fraction of low clouds. A large part are responsible for a large part of the cooling uh, caused by these clouds. The reason low clouds are so important is that they actually reflect a lot of the sunlight back into space. I mean, we know them for when we travel in airplanes. These are these monotonic scenes that we see over the oceans. And they are wide because they are reflecting uh, the sunlight back into space. And you can imagine if you change the amount of low clouds, you change the amount of energy that the surface gets. That means that low clouds have a strong cooling effect on the Earth's climate. So if we have more low clouds, climate will become colder. And if we have fewer cosmic rays, we have fewer low clouds, and the Earth becomes warmer. It's, 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 you mean with the ESPA data set? Yeah. It's in the infrared, what we've been looking at. That's interesting. Okay. Well, I first heard about uh, Henrik Svensmark's work when we became interested in looking at how aerosols, or very small particles, are produced in the Earth's atmosphere in the first place. I mean, this is important because all clouds are formed upon aerosol particles that are in the atmosphere. So you're looking, the satellite is looking at a specific parameter. I, I in terms know. of the work that we've done, what we've found is that the galactic cosmic rays are capable of modulating the aerosols or particles, small particles in the lowest part of the atmosphere. In fact, we can show that the aerosols produced by galactic cosmic rays are significantly modulated in the lower layer which contains these clouds that produce a cooling effect on the earth. What we don't understand at this point is exactly how and why they, they're formed. Every cloud droplet that's formed is formed on a particle initially in the air. And so it's absolutely crucial to understand how these particles come about and what their properties are. Otherwise, we can't ever hope to understand clouds and, and their behavior. And that's where cosmic rays actually might come in. Because what do cosmic rays do when they enter the Earth's atmosphere? They produce small ions. Oh, yes. yes. So it is the belief that these small charges help forming these small specks or aerosols in the US atmosphere. Whereas most people would think that since there's water in the atmosphere that naturally there'll be clouds, but that isn't true. The only way that clouds can form in the atmosphere, in our atmosphere, under normal conditions is to condense onto an aerosol or existing particle in the air. Every cloud droplet that's formed is formed on a particle initially in the air. All clouds are formed upon these aerosols. And so it's absolutely crucial to understand how these particles come about and what their properties are. Otherwise, we can't ever hope to understand clouds uh, and, and their behavior. In science, it's not enough just to have a good theory. You also need some experiments to support the ideas. I was very determined to get an experiment that could show that we had this connection between cosmic rays, aerosol formation, and clouds.
What I'm going to talk about is cosmic rays. These are particles, or very energetic particles. They enter the Earth's atmosphere and we can actually measure them. So when we have maximum activity, you see that there's not so many cosmic rays coming in to the Earth's uh, atmosphere. That's because now the Sun has a very strong magnetic field and it's difficult for the particles that come from the uh, galactic space to get into uh, the solar system. So there seems to be a uh, agreement between uh, changes uh, in solar activity and changes in climate. So what is really needed is some experimental uh, evidence that can say yes or no whether such a relation, I mean how, how does it really work, that is what is needed. And it's very fortunate that uh, such an experiment seem, is, uh, looks like will be uh, performed. I, I don't like to say, I think the experiment is completely misconceived and shows a complete lack of elementary knowledge about <coughs> how clay the clouds behave. So whichever way you look at it, that experiment is completely misconceived and will tell you nothing about what happens in the atmosphere. Well, I, to I totally disagree, but I should say that the people that are involved there are people that are experts in uh, aerosols and, uh, and atmospheric uh, chemistry, so they, they, they know what they're doing. So, and I, I know, I mean, they, they, they will disagree with your, your point of view, but it, it, it's true there are different uh, views, but you are one extreme, I would say. <laughs> I've many times given talks uh, where people have got very excited and very strongly trying to tell me that what I was doing was completely a waste of time. You read my book? Well, I know of your book. I know where you are then. You shouldn't argue with me on cloud physics. <laughs> no, the whole thing is a complete misconception. Not a single one has come up with anything from a scientific point of view that made me think that there was not something, a real scientific question, worth pursuing. So, I mean, you know, what's the point of doing that experiment? What? Well, there's been written several papers where they discuss where do the cloud condensation nuclei actually come from, how are they formed? Oh, we know that. No, it's not known, according to these persons. Oh, my God, well, they just must read the literature. They're... I had this theory, so I decided that we should do an experiment in Copenhagen that could show whether my idea was right or wrong. Unfortunately, it turned out to be much more difficult than I thought it would be. We actually started this without having no funds at all. And I just continued hoping that we would get money at some point. Building the laboratory, building the experiment, getting the funds, it actually took almost four years. The idea in this experiment is to investigate what is the role of cosmic rays. And the idea is that we in the end will be able to mimic the processes that are going on in the real atmosphere. So, so this whole chamber is built in such a way that we can control ions inside it and uh, we will be able to reveal for the first time how important ions are in the production of forming new aerosols and then in the end new clouds. The motivation for doing this experiment has uh, really been uh, trying to understand why there seems to be this relation between solar activity and climate on Earth. All this uh, political turmoil that is surrounding uh, global warming and so on is irrelevant for the, uh, the science. And the kind of experiment that we are doing, I think it's a necessary uh, experiment because it will uh, improve our understanding on one of the most important processes in the atmosphere, which is uh, cloud formation. Originally, I got interested uh, in the topic when a colleague of mine uh, in Germany asked me what are the effects of supernovae on life on Earth. And I decided to give him a serious answer. I, what I did, I uh, looked at uh, the literature and eventually uh, stumbled upon uh, Henrik Svensmark's uh, results about uh, cosmic rays and cloud cover.
So I realized that uh, if this uh, hypothesis is correct, that uh, cosmic rays affect cloud cover and climate, what it would mean is that also uh, variations which don't originate from the sun, but also variations from the whole Milky Way, they too will affect climate on Earth. Ever since I was a kid, I was uh, interested in astronomy. That's why I became an astronomer. I never realized as a kid, I mean, I always appreciated uh, this Milky Way, the fact that you can go out in a dark uh, night and see this beautiful uh, galaxy that we're inside of. It is something that we actually live in. It's part of us and it's affecting us. It's affecting uh, climate here on Earth. And you must take it into uh, account, into consideration, if you want to understand past variations uh, in the climate. What's fascinating is that this Milky Way, which looks something which is very far away, it isn't very far away. We are part of it. And this link between this Milky Way and us is cosmic rays. The solar system moves in and out of the spiral arms and the spiral arms are the regions where you have the new stars. And the new stars is also some of them the heavy stars that live very shortly and explode in supernova. That means that you have more cosmic rays as you move in to the um, uh, spiral arms. If we look at the Milky Way from the top, what we'll see are four spiral arms, and that's because the Milky Way is a spiral arm galaxy. So we have four, four spiral arms. We are located here on some small armlets. We are rotating around the sun once every year, but the whole solar system rotates around the Milky Way once every about 250 million years. That's one galactic year. What this means is that every 150 million years, when we pass through a spiral arm of the galaxy, it's colder by uh, something of order 5 degrees or 10 degrees. When we're outside of the spiral arm, it's hot. Now we're on this uh, small spur, so we're witnessing cold weather. When we enter a spiral arm of the galaxy, we are going to witness more uh, cosmic rays reaching the Earth more atmospheric ionization, more uh, cloud condensation nuclei, and therefore more low altitude clouds, or to be more uh, precise, whiter low altitude clouds, which better reflect the sunlight and cool the Earth. So the bottom line is that when we enter a spiral arm of the galaxy, we should expect lower temperatures. A hundred million years ago, these cliffs were part of the floor of a warm ocean. Earth back then was between spiral arms of the galaxy. All over the Earth, it was uh, much warmer. We had uh, dinosaurs sunbathing in Alaska or in Antarctica. About uh, 70 million years ago, uh, we started uh, approaching and entering the uh, Sagittarius uh, spiral arm. And Earth became exposed to a higher flux of cosmic rays because of all the stars uh, around us. This larger flux of cosmic rays was responsible for the formation of uh, more clouds and colder conditions here on Earth. The uh, ice sheets that uh, later formed, they actually pushed all those cliffs uh, out of the water like bulldozers and they uh, rippled the landscape. So what we see here in these cliffs is a good example for hot conditions on one hand when those cliffs were formed and a cold ice house conditions which we have today which are responsible for the uplifting and uh, current conditions of this, these cliffs. It may sound strange to most people that we're talking about ice house conditions today, but if you look on the long time scale, you find that during most of Earth's history, we didn't have any ice caps whatsoever. Today we have. 
450 million years ago, we had a very cold conditions here on Earth. However, we had more than 10 times as much CO2 in the atmosphere. So clearly, CO2 is not a major climate driver. At least it wasn't a major climate driver then. When we talk about climate changes on these timescales, it is a kind of climate change that is much, much more dramatic than anything we have seen uh, in, our, in our history. When we are in between spiral arms, it looks as if we are in a warm period called a hot house, and most of the ice is simply melted. There's no, no ice at all. When we are in the spiral arms, uh, half the area of the Earth is simply covered with ice. And the changes in climate, I mean, are much, much more dramatic than anything we have seen recently. Over the past uh, billion years, Earth has passed through uh, periods when it was cold and periods during which it was uh, hot. And lo and behold, the periods during which it was cold synchronize with the astronomical data, which tells us when we should have passed through spiral arms of the galaxy. At some point, I realized that you can actually uh, reconstruct the cosmic wave flux, and you can do it with these things, with the iron meteorites, because iron meteorites, after they break off their uh, asteroids, they are exposed to cosmic rays, and they record the cosmic rays in the solar system over hundreds of millions of years. And what you find is that this cosmic wave flux changes exactly as you would expect from the astronomical data on one hand, and it also changes exactly in sync with the uh, climate variations that you can uh, reconstruct using geological uh, records. I've been working almost all my, all my life on uh, issues related to the uh, environment. And of course, one of the biggest, um, biggest problems and issues was um, what was the climate and how the uh, temperature of the seawater changed. And we worked on the fossils like this, called, called brachiopods. These shells record the temperature of the past oceans. When they form, they reflect the temperature of the ocean water because they build in uh, the atom of oxygen, then you could measure this proportion of uh, oxygen and you could get a measure of the temperature of the past oceans and then that means of the temperature of the earth and climate. So when we can measure this, we would get a record of ocean temperature for 500 million years. When I look at the data, I realized that actually there were some oscillations in uh, the general trend of temperature and that those oscillations fitted quite well with what we knew from geology, what kind of a climate was at that time. Working with the, with the colleagues, we did an evaluation and statistical study of that, and we saw that there was some kind of a periodicity roughly over about 140 million years, switching back and forth between hot house and ice house. I suspected that the reason for the, this rough periodicity was something to do with the sky. But uh, I was searching for it and couldn't find anything. So, essentially I gave up. I didn't have an explanation. Jan Weiser, he reconstructed the temperature uh, using uh, geochemical uh, records. And the difference between that uh, reconstruction and what I was using is that Jan Weiser actually reconstructed the actual temperature. So he knew exactly how warm it was and how cold it was. So uh, I emailed uh, him. The one evening, I was sitting in my office working. Suddenly, an email popped up. And this was near Shariv. And uh, he says, well, I may have an explanation for you. He was telling me that he was working on uh, cosmic rays variability over the more or less the same time intervals, and that uh, the variability in the amount of cosmic rays hitting the Earth over this time interval was more or less similar to uh, the variation on, in uh, the, those oxygen atoms or in the climate which we observed. 
After I teamed up with the Jan Weiser, we had an actual temperature reconstruction. And what we could learn was that it was colder here on Earth by something like 5 to 10 degrees when we were inside spiral arms of the galaxy. Nobody found anything uh, like that before, and we were simply amazed from it. Uh, but more interestingly, what it means is that cosmic rays are the main climate driver on Earth, at least on geological timescales. And the only explanation uh, you have for it is uh, Svensmark's theory about the uh, cloud cover. When you compare the geological record to the astronomical record, that's what you get. You see that the two barcodes give you the same product. The black line is the geological reconstruction of the temperature on Earth using the geochemical uh, records that, uh, of uh, Jan Weiser. And what you see in the red is the uh, cosmic wave flux variation. When both things are added together, they correlate very well. Statistically, it's very significant, uh, but you don't have to believe the statistics. You can just look at it and realize that uh, it's, it's very meaningful. It's been said so many times that the sun has not been responsible for the heating we have seen uh, the last maybe 20, 40 years. However, if you look at the data, for instance, the ocean data, you will actually see that there's a very good agreement between temperatures and solar activity. And what you see is the temperature of the ocean down to about 50 meters. But if you compare the overall agreement with how the red curve is varying, it's very good. And the red curve, that is the cosmic rays. That is how the cosmic rays have been varying over this period. So we actually see, even today, that the sun is dominating the temperatures or how temperatures uh, evolve. It has done so in the past, it's doing this now, and will also do it in the future. An experiment like the one taking place here in uh, Copenhagen is crucial because it, if successful, it will shed a lot of light on the physical origin of the link between cosmic rays and climate. And this will be the last piece in the puzzle which would, would make the picture complete. So the effect, effective aerosol background corresponds more or less precisely to what you have over the ocean. The uh, experiment is not just something that you turn on and then you get the result. You get many, many results and you do a lot of experiments and you try to see if everything is consistent with that interpretation that you are giving. The results of this experiment, hopefully we will know exactly how the sun affects climate, how it modulates the cosmic rays reaching the Earth, how cosmic rays control the amount of uh, ionization, and how ionization controls climate, uh, and through uh, most probably a uh, formation of cloud cover. It's very interesting after nearly eight years of work that we finally got to this phase of trying to understand the, uh, the, these uh, experiments. All of the bits and pieces was done over nearly a year. So it's not like from one day to another you sort of a sudden jumps up and says, fantastic, we got the result. It's not like that. It's actually a hard work. Did you think? I mean, there's always a degree of uncertainty when you do experiments because you are constantly questioning everything you're doing, whether it's uh, uh, right and wrong. But we have done, we have been very, very careful and we have done many, many tests on, on these ideas, so I think, uh, I mean, I, I truly think that uh, we have found a very, very important mechanism, and the mechanism was a big surprise how it actually worked. It's far apart. I mean, this is 0.34 PBB, yeah. so it's very, very low. What we find when we mimic a higher flux of cosmic rays is that we actually produce more aerosols in the chamber 
This actually means that cosmic rays are producing aerosols and these are the aerosols which are responsible for forming clouds in the real atmosphere. Through our experiments, we have found a new form for atmospheric chemistry, which we think is responsible for the formation of new aerosols and therefore also for clouds in the Earth's atmosphere. And it shows that events in the universe are driving climate here on Earth to an extent that has never been understood before. large part of the clouds that we see in the, in the sky is really a result of this process that uh, we have investigated experimentally. But of course, uh, I mean, now we have to see how other colleagues react uh, to our findings and that will be very interesting to see how this work will be received. But I think we have done a very uh, good work and uh, I'm very pleased that, it, uh, I mean, how Everybody has been working on, on this this project. So this is a this is a culmination of uh, many years of work. This is really nice. We thought we had a really scientific breakthrough in the understanding of how cosmic rays affect uh, the Earth's cloud cover and therefore also the Earth's climate. But for very strange reasons, we could not get the paper published. I think we submitted it four times to different journals and we still could not get these results published. Henrik Svensmark and his group had very nice results and I would have expected them to be published uh, immediately, a few months after they found it. Instead, it took them 16 months to publish it. And uh, the reason, I think, is because of reluctance of the uh, climate community as a whole, in particular those uh, who are supporting the anthropogenic greenhouse gas theory, to accept the idea that this new theory uh, which is already shown to be supported by a lot of empirical evidence, is also supported by experimental evidence. The most frustrating part about the rejections was that there was no real critique that we had done anything wrong. It was things like, it's not interesting, it's too long. There was no real critique of the ideas, so therefore this type of rejection was even more frustrating. Editors are sometimes remarkably naive about these things, but I think they really should look into these things. And when a negative report is conspicuously without substance, they should ask the referee to clarify it. This is, has a new dimension now that global warming is a political issue. Uh, things become politically incorrect. And in the United States, at least, we have cases of good solid research on global warming being refused for publication because somebody has made up his mind that that isn't the way it is and you can't publish. Uh, I think this is not only unfortunate for the author, it's unfortunate for the country and the world as a whole because this is a problem we had better get straight so we know what to do. Finally, I think after more than a year of, of waiting, we got the paper published in the Royal Society. At the end of this journey, I can now say with great confidence, yes, we have found a very beautiful solution to the cloud mystery. And what remains a mystery is when the rest of the climate community 
will understand that far greater powers are controlling the climate from the outside. The sun affects climate here on Earth. The Milky Way affects climate here on Earth. And if you want to understand what's going on, we have to take uh, these factors into account. It's beautiful because uh, instead of us living here in this uh, isolated planet, we're part of this uh, galactic ecosystem. We're witnessing what's going on uh, around us. These ideas are showing that the Earth is no longer just an isolated little island floating around in the universe. We are part of the big universe and the processes that are going on there, like star formation on the long time scales, uh, or changes in the solar activity, will all affect the Earth's climate. And it can have very large changes in the Earth's climate because of this.